Congratulations. Good. All right, so we want to, um, the next, well, not exactly the next three weeks. We've got two weeks, two weeks, and then uh, we've got a VBS Sunday. We've got VBS coming up, and at, at the end of the VBS week, we're going to have a special Sunday where uh, the kids take over. That's going to be fun. And uh, so that's coming in a, in a couple weeks, but we've got two weeks then VBS Sunday, and then a third week that we're going to be doing a little mini-series on the journey of transformation, the work that God does in our lives uh, to transform us. Uh, the, the Bible word, the, the Greek, I know, I know this gets weird when I do the Greek geek thing, but the New Testament is written in the language of Greek. But this one you'll recognize. The, uh, the Greek word in the New Testament for transformation, the work God does to change us, the word in the Greek is metamorphosis. Metamorphosis. Right? And if we get that picture in our heads of, uh, of what happens in the metamorphosis of a caterpillar, a creepy, crawly, gross, slimy, caterpillar right into a butterfly it is an absolute transformation unrecognizable difference between what was and what is right it's more than so so the work god does in us the metamorphosis that he does in us as followers of jesus is more than just an extreme makeover Right? Where cuts our hair and for the ladies, puts some makeup on our face, and some new clothes, go shopping spree, put on some new clothes. Wow, whole new person, right? I mean, you change the clothes, you change the hair, you change the face. That doesn't change the person. But the work that God does in our hearts and in our lives as followers of Christ in our journey of transformation through our lives is a miracle of metamorphosis, a miracle of transformation from one kind of thing to another kind of thing, right? A new kind of human with the eternal seed of the kingdom of God in our hearts and the spirit of God living in us powerfully metamorphosis. Now, we know that the transformation that God does doesn't happen in an instant when we become the new creation, when we come to Christ and are, we talked about this last week out in the park, we talked about this, this phrase, born again, right? As we said last week, that, that phrase gets overused and it has a whole lot of baggage with it sometimes, but, but coming to Christ is really like being born into a whole new life, born into the kingdom, born into a new way of being and a new way of living. We become a new creature, a new creation, the Bible says, right? But we know that the transformation doesn't all happen in that day because none of us in this room are yet what we will be. We're in process. Thank God is right, right? We're in process. God is transforming us into something new. The seed of it has started in our hearts. The new creation has begun, but he is in the process. We're on a journey of transformation in our lives. Um, and, and over the centuries, the, the church theologically, is used different words for this process that happens. And we don't want to get bogged down in this, but the, the, we've used different words like glorification. We, we become glorified. Deification. We become like God. Theosis. Recapitulation. But the one that we're probably in our circles most familiar with is sanctification. Right? We're, 
We're made holy. We're made different. We're made separate. We're made like Christ. And all of these phrases are the, they mean being perfected or completed in our transformation to be like Jesus. That's the goal. That's what the Father is working in our lives day by day, moment by moment, as we trust Him and walk with Him, is this transformation to be like Christ. And so the process begins when we become the new creation at our new birth, when we come to Christ, put our faith in Him, trust in Him, follow Him. The process begins there. But how are we transformed? What, what, is, what does the process look like? How are we changed? What, what is it that we can do or need to do to participate or cooperate with what God is doing in us? How does it happen? That's what we're talking about in this series. And, and I want to I cover a couple of myths. We're myth-busting today a little bit. Okay? A couple of myths about how we are transformed. And I think the, the first is, first myth is that we're transformed by sin management. Right? I was, I was a sinner before. I was sinning before. Now I need to just stop sinning and then I will be holy and then I will be different. The problem is, that was the exact theology of the Pharisees when Jesus met them. It was the exact theology of the Pharisees. Just be better. Just stop doing stuff and start doing other stuff. Right? Jesus said, you can clean the outside of the cup, but if you leave the inside of the cup the way it was, then you haven't changed a thing. We can change the externals. We can change the things that we do or don't do, but that doesn't transform our hearts. It doesn't change what we are and who we are. And so often the church slides into this distraction of trying to make ourselves and others behave, right? Just do the right stuff. Stop doing that. Stop. I saw that, right? And yet, we change all those things outwardly and then nothing, nothing changes on the inside. Instead, we get enslaved to desperately trying to reach a goal that we can never reach. I've got to be good enough. I've got to be good enough. I've got to, oh, I can't stop doing that, but I want to stop, but I can't, but it's difficult. And we just keep trying to be better, and all we do is end up enslaved To a process that we can never achieve in our strength. And, and in fact, um, Paul says in uh, Colossians chapter 2. This is interesting. Colossians chapter 2, starting in verse 20. Paul says, Since you died with Christ... To the elemental spiritual forces of this world. That's a mouthful we won't get into today. But since there, this change has happened, why as though you still belonged to the world, do you, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle. Do not, so do not touch. Do not taste. These rules, which have to do with things that are destined to perish with use, are based on mere human commands and teachings. Such regulations, indeed, have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship and their false humility and treatment of the body, 
but they lack any value in restraining sex, sensual indulgence. So imposing rules on ourselves to just stop doing some things and start doing other things doesn't change us. That's what Paul's saying. Right? So that's myth number, t- number one. Myth number two is transformation by doing ministry. We act sometimes in the church as though the transformation comes in, in just doing things for God. If I just do more stuff for Him, I'm going to be changed. Jesus said in Matthew 7, starting verse 22, He said, Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not? prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles didn't we do a lot of stuff for you and then i will tell them plainly i never knew you away from me you evildoers Ooh. right but jesus we did all this stuff we worked really hard We work hard because we think that's what God wants from us, and yet we never truly let Him in to change us. And again, we get enslaved to trying harder and harder and burning ourselves out with no results of transformation. Right? Ever been there? I just got to do more. Maybe I haven't done enough. Maybe if I just do a little more. Right? So if those things are not the process, if that's not how we are changed, how does the process work and how can we participate with it? It's something the Holy Spirit does in us, but Scripture is clear that we have a responsibility to participate, to cooperate in the process. I think there are at least three things, that's why we've got three messages in this little series, at least three important things that we can do to participate with and enter into the process of transformation in our lives. So the first today is beholding. We'll get to what that is in a a bit. Beholding. So, I want to do a little bit of, uh, the passage we're going to look at is in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. So if you have Bibles or Bible apps, turn with me there. 2 Corinthians, halfway through the New Testament or so. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to do a little bit of background here. So it's always important to read Scripture in its context to understand what it's getting at. So we're going to start at verse 7, 1 Corinthians 3. I'm going to grab some glasses. Now, if the ministry that brought death, that's kind of weird. Who wants that ministry? Right? Maybe, maybe some of you do and you shouldn't. But um, If the ministry that brought death, what's that talking about? It's talking about the Old Testament law, right? The, the, the law that, that came to Moses... In, in, the, in the Old Testament. Um, why did it bring death? Because it exposed by the law, by the standard of God, by the law, it exposed our complete inability to live righteously. Right? It exposed our... So, so it showed that we are spiritually dead. It didn't do anything to us. It just exposed what was already our predicament. 
right? So if the ministry that brought death, the Old Testament law coming down to Moses from God, which was engraved in letters on stone, right? The Ten Commandments came with glory so that the Israelites could not look steadily on the face of Moses because of its glory, transitory or passing away though it was. Will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? Okay, so, so what Paul's saying is, um, so Moses, when he was in the presence of God, receiving the law from him, when he came out of the presence of God, the Bible says his face was glowing so brightly, the people couldn't, didn't want to come near him, and they asked they, they wanted him to put a veil on his face. Cover it up, Moses. It's too bright. It's too glorious. If, if the, the glory not of, from God, but off of Moses' face after being with God, this passing away glory was, was so glorious that people stood back, didn't want to come close, how much more glorious is the ministry of the Spirit, is the ministry that God does through us today and wants to do through us today, okay? Um, if the ministry that brought condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness, Right? If the, the ministry of the law that showed us how wretched we are and how desperately in need of salvation we are was glorious, how much more the, the ministry that actually can change our hearts, that actually can make us righteous, that can actually make us a new kind of person, how glorious is that, says Paul. For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was transitory or passing away came with glory, how much greater the glory of that which lasts. What God is doing in you is not fading away. It's not passing away. It is eternal and it is increasing. It is growing in you every day. Amen? Yeah. Right, so, um, okay, let's, uh, yeah. So, if we go down to verse 12, yes, what a hope. Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold, it says. All right, so that's the, oops, I forgot to put that up there. There's Moses. I mean, it's just an artist's picture of it, right? But Moses in the presence of God and, and glowing. All right. Since we have such a great hope, we are very bold. 12 to 16. We are not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. But their minds were made dull, for to this day the same veil remains when the old covenant is read, it's not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, Paul says, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But when it, whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord... No, we'll stop there. The veil is taken away. So, Paul's, Paul's saying, since we have such a great hope, right, that, that God is doing something in us that is so much greater and more glorious than what he did in Moses or through Moses, we are very bold, he says. We can be bolder with God. We can be bolder with people, right? Right? There is, there is everything to gain and nothing to lose by boldly diving into a relationship with Christ and sharing 
the Christ we encounter with others. We are not those who shrink back from the glory of God like the people of Israel did. But we lean in boldly as those who can take hold of Jesus. Right? Who can take hold of Jesus, the glory of God revealed to us. And so he talks about the, the veil over the hearts of those who read the scriptures until they come to Christ. <clears throat> those, those who try to find God in the scriptures without first coming to Christ will flounder blindly with the words because the scriptures only come alive by Christ. Right? They only come alive in Christ. The Bible is not just a better self-help book. Just do these things and your life will just work out. Right? The Bible is not just a better self-help book, but it is the revelation of the plan of God to redeem and reconcile the whole world to Him in Christ. So first of all, the, the scriptures are all about Him. And so if we, don't, if we don't recognize Jesus in the scriptures, we miss the point of the book. We can study them, we can read them, we can dig into them, and if we miss the point that Jesus is the point, then we're wasting our time. Jesus said this to the Pharisees when he said, in John 5, 39, he said, You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, Jesus said, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. So the scriptures are about him. If we miss that, we miss the point. And, and secondly, it is... His Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus that illuminates the Scriptures to them and make them food for our spirit and for our hearts. Amen? All right. Now, here's the passage we... Uh, all of that was, was preparation. Here's the passage I really wanted us to get to this morning. Now, the Lord... This is verse 17... Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled faces, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed, metamorphosized, right, that the... The, the process of metamorphosis has taken place in us. We're, we're going from creepy, crawly caterpillars, worms, to glorious butterflies, right? Something different, being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. Different translations say, ever increasing glory, says one. And another one says, from glory to glory. From glory to glory to glory to glory. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. All right, so th three things from this from this. From these couple verses. Freedom. The Lord is the Spirit. It's kind of a weird phrase, isn't it? The Lord is the Spirit. We serve a triune God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the Spirit of God that lives in you, if you have become a follower of Christ, if you are walking with Jesus, 
The Spirit of God that is in, on the inside of you is the Spirit of Jesus. It's not some force. We're not in Star Wars episode here. Right? But it's the Spirit of Jesus on the inside of you. The Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Freedom. Right? Freedom from slavery... To sin, yes, but also freedom from slavery to religion. Those things that we talked about earlier, where we are often enslaved on treadmills of trying to just be better and do more. When the Spirit of God is on the inside of you and, and, you, and we allow Him to do the, the renovation work that He's doing, knocking out walls and tearing things down and rebuilding on the inside of us, when we let Him do the work that He's doing, then, we, then, then that transformation happens from the inside out without the slavery to having to do more and be more. the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. We, we work harder, we try harder, we do all those things because we think that those are the things God wants from us. But we need to hear the Father say this morning, Beloved, what I want from you is you. I want your heart. I want your attention. I want your focus. I want you to live the spirit life that sets you free from the effort of the flesh. The spirit of the Lord is there is freedom. And we all with unveiled faces. We just read about the veil of understanding Scripture that, that's removed in Christ. But I think there are other veils that we sometimes wear. Because we're afraid that if we don't make ourselves good enough, God's judgment, God's anger is just going to destroy us. And so we put a veil on. God, I, I don't want you to see who I really am. Newsflash, he already sees. He's got better x-ray vision than Superman. Right? We all, with unveiled faces who come into God's presence with no masks, with no false methods of trying to measure up, but we come nakedly and unreservedly before Jesus, the only one who can transform us. We bring our whole imperfect, broken doubting, uncertain, struggling self into his presence as we are, and we let him change us. He is the only one that can, folks. Upon the moment of Jesus' death, the Bible tells us that the, temp the curtain is in the temple that separated the holy place from the holy of holies. That, that protected the people of Israel from the glory of God. The, the curtain, the veil was ripped from top to bottom. In other words, only God could have done it. 
God ripped the veil. He tore the veil. Because he said, I, it is time for you to come into my presence through Christ as you are because I will change you. Hebrews 10, verse 19 says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence or boldness, some translations say, since we have boldness to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body, And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and the full assurance that faith brings. It's not an amazing invitation. The curtain has been ripped, folks, torn open. God is inviting us into his presence. Not after we've cleaned ourselves up, but just as we are. God, I need to come and know you. Meet with you. We all, with unveiled faces, Behold him. So now we get to the real key. It's the last point this morning, but I want to I want to just take a few moments with this. We what is it we need to do? This is a question we've been asking all morning. What is the question? What, what is what is it that we need to do? to cooperate with the process of transformation in our lives. One of the most important things that causes our transformation is beholding Him. Let's look at the, let's look at the verse again. Let's back it up. We all with unveiled faces, beholding the glory of of the Lord are being transformed into the same image, the image of God's glory. We're being made to look like Him. By the way, we were made, Adam and Eve were made to image God. Remember that? God said, let's make Humans in our image and our likeness. Our purpose on the earth was to image God in the world. That image was damaged, wasn't it? What he's doing in us is to remake us into that image. Isn't that beautiful? He's remaking us into that image. Beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. This comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Beholding Him. That's it? What? As Pastor, that seems just a little too easy. Isn't there... You don't have to climb a mountain or some stairs on broken glass or, or you know, deprive myself of something or, or you know, aren't, aren't I supposed to memorize the whole Bible or do something really extreme for God to change me? Isn't there something more difficult I'm supposed to do? But we're told that it's in beholding Him. Beholding Him that we are transformed to be like Him. 
sounds so simple, but most of us can't stop long enough to even figure out what that means. Right? We're on a treadmill. We got to keep going. Got to keep doing. We got to keep performing. We got to keep producing. And Jesus says, Stop and behold me because I am beholding you. Even our prayer times are usually about making sure we give Jesus our whole list because even in prayer, we're trying to perform feats of spiritual valor. We're, supposed to, we're trying to be really, you know, accomplish something in our prayer time. And there's nothing wrong with lists. But God's waiting for us to just come and be with Him. To behold Him. Peter and John were arrested in the temple courts for preaching the gospel. And they were questioned by the Jewish spiritual leaders. Acts 4 verse 13 says, When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. What was it that had transformed Peter and John, had they, had they, you know, done a whole bunch of stuff? Had they memorized a whole bunch of stuff? No, they had been with Jesus for three years. And being with him had changed them forever. What we need most is not to learn much about Jesus or talk much about Jesus or do much for Jesus, but to be much with Jesus. The other things will come as fruit from being with Him. As we are changed and transformed, we will know much about Him, and do much for Him, but as fruit of a transformed heart. So what does it mean to behold Him? I think first of all it means sitting in His presence without an agenda and without a list. Again, lists are good. I need lists to remember stuff like many of you do when we're praying, right? But to to take time to sit in his presence without an agenda and without a list and listen. Even if you don't hear anything, sit and listen. Push through the awkward silence. Push through the compulsion to do something to say something, to accomplish something, and just be with Him. Worship. Worship is not just singing, although it includes music, but it's acknowledging and recognizing the worth of the one that you behold. You become like that which we continually look upon. The verse we read at the beginning of the service, that Tina read at the beginning of the service this morning, said, One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek Him in His temple. The Bible talks a lot about seeking the face of God. And that's a weird sounding phrase. But we need face time with Jesus. Thirdly, what does it mean 
sitting in his presence without an agenda, worship, pouring out your heart to him. And we pour out our heart on Facebook, at the coffee shop, we pour out our heart to all kinds of places and all kinds of people, but do we pour out our heart to the one that loves us the most? Right? Pour out our heart to him. Spending time in the word. Because the gospel reveals the glory of Jesus. We need to spend time in God's word. Keep hungering for him. That, that the passage we read, like I said, one of the translations is ever increasing glory. Right? He's transforming us by ever increasing glory. Wherever you're at in your spiritual journey, keep hungering for Jesus because there is more. There is more. No matter where, what you've walked through and what you've experienced and how what mountaintop you might be on today. There is more, right? Ever increasing glory. Meet him at the table. In a few moments, we're going to turn to communion. In communion, we meet Jesus once again at the cross and gaze upon the horror and beauty of what happened there. We gaze upon the glory of God's perfect plan to reconcile us all to himself by the blood of Christ shed on the cross. So I want to encourage you this summer I know we often say, find time, right? I've got to find time to clean out my shed. I'm never going to find it. I've got to make time to clean out my shed, right? I want to encourage you, make time to learn the new discipline of beholding Jesus. It is crucial to your transformation, your metamorphosis into something more glorious. We are changed from glory to glory to glory, from one level to the next. And it isn't about beholding him once, but learning to behold him daily. As we keep coming back to the place of beholding, we continually reorient our lives to him and gain perspective from his presence. We are transformed into the image of Christ. Let's stand. Worship team, come on up. We're going to turn to the table of communion in just a moment. But I want to I wanna pray as we shift gears here. God, I thank you for the wisdom and goodness of your grace. That you know our frailty, you know our weakness, you know that we are incapable of transforming ourselves, becoming something new and different ourselves. And so, so you invite us into, not only into a relationship with you, but into intimacy with you. That we would know you and be known. That we would behold you and be beheld. And spending time in stillness with you. Contemplating 
your love, your mercy, your goodness, gazing upon the beauty of who you are, that we are actually transformed. So God, I pray that you would continue that work that you've begun in us. For those in this room or watching online that maybe this morning just are saying, I don't, I don't know if I've entered into that new kind of life. I don't, I don't know if I've been changed into a new creation. God, I pray that today you would, you would do that work in their hearts to draw them to yourself, that today would be the day they say yes to you. I pray that as we approach your table, to sit with you, to gaze upon your grace and your love in the cross. That you would do your transforming work in us even today. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Those that are serving communion can come on up as we prepare our hearts to receive from the Lord. We, uh, uh, some, some housekeeping things about communion for those of you who are newer with us um, and guests this morning. We practice open communion. That means if you know Jesus as your Savior, then it uh, doesn't matter what your church background is or, or we just invite you to come and share communion with us. Um, so as the, as the trays come by, you can, you can receive them. If, uh, if you are on a journey and you're not sure that you're ready today to make that commitment of faith to Christ, we honor the journey God has you on. There's no pressure here today. Um, God has you on his timing. And when you're ready to cross that line of faith, you'll know it. Right, And so if you today need to just pass the tray by, don't feel any shame or weirdness about that, just, just pass it on to the next person. It's okay. Uh, when you receive the tray, there are two cups, one inside the other. The bottom cup has a little wafer in it. The top cup has juice. Take both of them, separate them, just hold on to them until we all have them in our hands and we'll celebrate communion together. Come on up, guys. Let's, uh, as the team leads us in worship for the next few moments, let's just quietly, I mean, sing along, but also just in your hearts, quietly focus your heart on the, on the Lord and what he has done for us on the cross.
2 Corinthians verse chapter 5, verse 17. There, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed us to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So we're thankful today for Jesus' body nailed to that Roman cross. Scripture says that he was pierced for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. So Jesus, we are so thankful today for your body hanging on that cross. That in some way that I don't understand, my sin, my guilt was placed upon you on that cross. And when you died there, it died with you. And I am free. And so we thank you today that you bore our sin to the cross in your flesh. And we take this emblem of your broken body and celebrate that together today in Jesus' name. Let's take the emblem of his broken body. Jesus, as we, in our hearts, in our minds and spirits this morning, as we gaze upon the cross, as we behold the cross, what we, what we notice is that your blood is shed, your blood is poured out. That we are purchased, redeemed, freed, from sin, purchased not by things that are passing away like silver and gold, but by the precious blood of Christ lamb shed before the foundation of the earth. So Jesus, we thank you for your blood shed for us. Thank you for the freedom, the hope, the peace, the love of the Father that we have today because your blood was shed for us. Let's take the emblem of his shed blood. Precious is the let's stand and sing it that makes me white as
one more time. Oh, precious. Oh, precious is the blood that makes me white as snow. Oh, no other that I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God is so good. Thank you, Pastor, for sharing the word with us today. And may God help us this week to spend a little bit more time with Jesus, beholding him, beholding him. You have yourselves a great week. And by the way, if anyone today would like special prayer, we believe in healing. By his stripes, we are healed. If you feel that you need to come at this time to be prayed over, we would encourage you to come. Members of the Breakthrough Team will pray over you the prayer of faith, believing God for your healing for whatever your.